Good afternoon. I'm Trevor Bechtel, the facilitator of the Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions, and we've reached the end of our series this week. Um, it's been a great series, so thanks so much um, for attending and for being a part of it. Uh, and I'll just um, have one quick announcement for students in the course that we, there will be a session next week to kind of review everything um, in the basement um, at the same time. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing you then if you want, if you want to come to that. But with that, um, I will turn things over again to our faculty director, Luke Schaefer, author of The Injustice of Place, a, a new book that um, you should all read, um, to introduce the alumni panel. Um, not something that we could have done. We still think of ourselves as a new initiative at Poverty Solutions, but all of a sudden we have some alumni who have worked with us and moved on to other things. So, Luke. I think this is like our eighth uh, our eighth season of Poverty Solutions. So if we were a TV show, we'd be really, really successful. That's a good run at this point, right? Um, so thanks everyone. I wanted to do this mainly uh, purely selfishly because I wanted to see these wonderful people and just really think about uh, the Poverty Solutions um, argument, the, like the, the, the model, the movement perhaps of trying to uh, use uh, really start with listening and uh, understanding what the communities uh, we work with prioritize and what they identify as their largest challenges, uh, bringing uh, research data and evidence to the, to the equation uh, to find out strategies that can address these issues, uh, not defined by researchers in most cases, but uh, defined by community members, and then use that to really try to um, uh, put in place systems level solutions that can make systems work better for families at the bottom of the economic ladder. And so for a long time, I've uh, contended that, that uh, the listening part is unusual among uh, academic research institutions, just a priority to take on issues that um, other people uh, that com the communities really uh, drive rather than our own interests, our own reading of the literature. Uh, so it's the front end of listening and I think the back end of really trying to put in place things that make systems work better uh, for families that makes poverty solutions unique uh, or at least uh, quite unusual in the space. So. I was just curious to think about how that spreads uh, throughout the world. So uh, our students in this class uh, will take the class and maybe uh, take um, elements of this approach into their future work. But we've also had uh, former staff and uh, students who have worked at the initiative for uh, a long time um, and uh, have moved on to other things. And we've got uh, we have many of those, but three here that uh, have been uh, particularly um, impactful during their time at Poverty Solutions and then as they went into the world. Um, so uh, I was going to just ask them a series of questions, pepper them with questions, and then turn it over to you all to uh, pepper with questions as well. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Josh Rivera, who was a... Uh, 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 let's see, a director of policy research at some point uh, at Poverty Solutions. And I wonder, it was your first job out of graduate school, right, Josh? And um, uh, and I, I don't think it's, uh, un, it's not unfair to say that millions of people's lives are a bit different in some ways because of your work. So tell us about sort of coming into Poverty Solutions and uh, and then uh, give me give us sort of the arc of your story to start out with. Uh, don't talk too much about auto insurance because I'm going to ask you about that later. Uh, and uh, and then what you did afterwards. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Luke, for hosting this. Hello. Hi. Um, so yes, yeah, so my start at Poverty Solutions uh, occurred right after grad school as the initiative was starting up. And to me, it was exciting because it was everything that that, that center with the staff that it had and the focus could engage more in policy in the ways that I wanted to than 
a career not in poverty solutions. And you brought up a couple of those things. One is the ability to listen. You know, in a lot of research organizations and a lot of policy spaces, you are making products for clients. You are trying to, you know, manage your way through policy windows. But at a university, you have the ability to be a place where people convene and convene and folks can listen. And one of the leadership lessons I think all staff at Poverty Solutions really took was how you listen to find common ground and build trust. Because universities don't have the best reputation of building trust. But I think centers like this that are intimately engaged with communities do that. And for me, it was startling to be able to go to places like a workforce center, work with the housing commission, talk about the digital divide, be engaged in a whole host of issues because for the residents of the cities in Michigan, they're not separate issues. They're one life that they're going through. And that lesson of like, how do we take all of these disparate policy pieces and put them together for policymakers so they really understand what poverty is like, what folks are going through was invaluable. Absolutely. And Josh, can you tell us uh, at the start uh, a bit about what you have done since the type of work that you've done and, and maybe some of the policy changes uh, either at the Department of Health and Human Services or otherwise that uh, you were part of? Yeah, well, Luke's reputation uh, preceded me. You know, it allowed, uh, I had worked with uh, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and my role was policy director over the safety net in Michigan. So when you think of food assistance, cash assistance, folks who are low income seeking to sort of help make ends meet, they apply often uh, at programs at MDHHS, and my role was to dictate what this policy look like for those programs. Who is eligible? What steps do they need to take to apply to them? How do caseworkers interact with clients? Uh, and so in that work, I started in March of 2020, which is the best uh, month to start a job. And the bulk of it was completely transitioning our safety net to be virtual, while at the same time being more accessible, being more dignified, uh, and helping people a little bit more. Um, so the work that we did there spanned everything from helping put together uh, Pandemic EBT, which is a program that when kids were not able to get school lunches, MDHHS and human service departments across the country sent EBT cards so that folks could have food benefits to make up for kids who had lost their school lunches who often need them, to working on energy assistance uh, and helping pay off utility bills all across the state. None of that I think would have been possible or done as effectively if it wasn't for the research and the data that we had access to that helped us make complex decisions in COVID, as well as grappling with a crisis and trying to figure out how to keep people safe. So a lot of the lessons we learned that I learned here about the safety net and how we could expand it uh, were pivotal as I was looking over a host of programs from cash to disability to energy. And uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, might be just a marker of how much you did was um, uh, deciding how to spend uh, 200 million extra dollars in LIHEAP dollars. And how did you go about sort of making a decision when all of this money came down from the American Rescue Plan, plan and LIHEAP is one of those programs that um, can be used to help people with energy assistance or uh, prevent them from having large bills? Like, how do you go about deciding how to spend $200 million? Yeah, across the programs that I oversaw, 1.3 million in people in Michigan received some kind of service. Um, LIHEAP being a significant chunk uh, in terms of its widespread reach. Uh, with energy assistance in this country, the kind of supports that families can get is disparate across different agencies and departments. One part of the money that I managed on LIHEAP went to the Treasury Department so that they can send tax credits to folks um, to help them pay for their bills. The others was managed through offices all throughout um, the state. For us, there was a couple of ways that we approached it. The one was we need to have a really good sense of what are the most high impact ways we can use those dollars to help us deal with what at the time was a substantial economic crisis that people were facing. You know, we were getting calls all the time about people who got their heat cut off, people who are struggling to get their electricity bills, people who are fighting with corporations trying to figure out how can we manage to make ends meet. And so from our perspective, the one was be really close to the evidence and the research because folks will find those loopholes, those, those windows where you maybe can use funds more creatively. In the case of LIHEAP, um, there's a whole host of, of strategies that we were able to implement that were a little more non-traditional. Something that we did that Luke was intimately involved with was something called LIHEAP Direct. The idea is traditionally, when we think of welfare policy, if you're going through something, you have to do the work of applying, trying to get approval, managing your own case application, all while dealing with 
hunger or whatever issue you're dealing with. We wanted to see if we could use things like automatic eligibility. If folks were already enrolled in one social service program like SNAP or food stamps, that would make them qualified for another program that had similar or even lower qualifications. Uh, and doing the math on who would match there, how many families could we serve? How could we make sure that we could make the process easier for them and sometimes do it automatically during COVID uh, was a principal concern for us because we needed to be active speed and active immediate impact. The second thing was we wanted to make sure that what we were doing was evidence-based. And in a human services department, in any state agency, there's no time to sit and read academic journals. There's not a lot of time for philosophizing. You really need researchers who know how to talk to folks who are engaged in the work to tell us, hey, here's the three things you need. And as a center, there was no one who spoke, I think, better to practitioners than Poverty Solutions did. You know, there was constant references um, to the kind of data that Pat was putting out, to the work that Alyssa had done. I mean, Pat was helping with the Poverty Task Force, and all those recommendations were super helpful in that case. Awesome. So uh, speaking of Alyssa, uh, tell us a little bit about your time. So uh, one of our great... Um, research partners as a student coming up through and it has gone on to a career in treasury. So tell us about what you worked on while you were here and uh, as what, a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Alyssa Graff. Um, I uh, worked as a research assistant with Poverty Solutions during my time here. I um, was pursuing a master's of public policy and a master's of science and data science with the School of Information. Um, so really the opportunities with uh, Poverty Solutions were a perfect uh, space for me to kind of uh, use both of my interests of uh, things that are policy related as well as things that are pretty data related. Um, so one of the most memorable projects that I worked on at Poverty Solutions was, um, it was actually more of a qualitative approach to understanding uh, barriers for affordable home repair in Detroit. Um, so I was cold calling contractors who work in the city of Detroit by just, you know, Googling some contractors and calling them up and then doing some, you know, survey, you know, methodology to understand, okay, these were some of the themes um, and this is what, you know, maybe the, the Housing Revitalization Department, who is the partner that I was working with, um, could maybe implement um, for next steps to look into this further, um, which then another research assistant carried on further after um, my initial research there. So that was a really cool opportunity to get really uh, hands-on and engaged with um, pressing issues that, you know, can, the solutions that you can dream up of and and consider during this research, they may actually be implemented um, given the integrity with which we do our research um, at Poverty Solutions and the way in which um, we collaborate as well, like Josh was mentioning, with partners and community. Um, so that was a really, uh, I think, memorable project. And Alyssa, do you know anything about why did we end up thinking about home repair at all? Ooh. This was many years ago, but I think the problems are still there. <laughs> um, I, so in the city of Detroit, uh, one of the, the huge challenges, um, a city where, you know, so much of the population lives um, below the poverty line, um, making home repairs is incredibly expensive, um, in part because a lot of contractors don't want to do work in the city of Detroit, and those that do charge uh, quite the premium to do it. Um, and so part of the, the policy issues that the Housing Revitalization Department were facing was, okay, we have a lot of, one, we have a lot of people in houses that need repair um, to just live a good quality life. We also have a lot of houses that are vacant that need to be repaired that could then provide housing for many of the unhoused in our city or many, you know, trying to build back the population of Detroit. Um, and so trying to find these solutions to how can we make this more affordable in order to increase the available housing and the quality of housing. There's plenty of available housing, but the quality of housing is really the key challenge that Detroit is still facing. Um, but working one step at a time to make it to lower those barriers to access, I think. Yeah, I think we came into home repair in part because uh, much of the early work that we supported uh, was uh, around tax foreclosure and the huge crisis of uh, Detroiters losing their homes and the city going from majority owner to majority renter. Roshanak Medipana uh, at the School of Public Health, Alexa Eisenberg, um, Margie Dewar were all faculty uh, who were driving some of that early work. 
And we're a part of some very significant policy innovations uh, that uh, led to pathways for renters where the landlord had not paid the rent to become uh, an owner of a home. And we were able actually through those programs, and now I think thousands and thousands of Detroiters have been through, to uh, stabilize uh, housing uh, for uh, thousands of families. Uh, but very quickly through the evaluation research, we were able to see that the homes were in, in really um, difficult. Uh, there was a lot of home repair that was needed for all the reasons that you mentioned. And also it was a relatively old uh, base. And so much of Detroit's uh, housing stock is in single family homes too. So uh, there's no, the scale, you know, you're working on one house, you're working on one house. So it all uh, actually fit into sort of, uh, to me, the ecosystem of listening, right? And sort of following the nose of, all right, we've we figured out this challenge. And, and then after Matt, that, the DMAX survey, uh, the Detroit Metropolitan Area Community Survey, um, which is a representative survey of Detroiters, was able to see that home repair was actually a top uh, policy priority. So again, it sort of started with listening and then trying to um, find solutions that fit with that problem. So Alyssa, before we turn it over to Pat, what else, what are you, what are you doing now? Tell us about your work at the Treasury Department. Yeah, sure. Um, so after I graduated, I um, went through the Presidential Management Fellowship Program. Um, so I, uh, it's essentially, you know, a, a way in which you are able to um, get into the federal government at a, you know, all different agencies are able to hire through this. I highly recommend looking into it for folks who are doing master's programs right now. Um, and so I, um, I graduated into the pandemic and uh, was looking to utilize um, a lot of the skills that I had learned both through my work with Poverty Solutions and through the data science degree and the policy degree, trying to match all of that together. Um, and I found this great research division in the Internal Revenue Service. Um, we're called the Research Applied Analytics and Statistics Division. Um, and specifically my team, um, the... Uh, sorry, program and innovation team is what we're called. Um, we work with a lot of academics who um, have applied to use um, administrative tax data to do their research. And so we work together with these academics. Um, we will often partner with them in their research projects and produce some pretty incredible work. Um, so one of the more notable projects I was able to work on through this um, was, I'm sure many people heard earlier this year, some research came out of a collaborative effort from Stanford University and actually some folks here at University of Michigan um, looking at audit disparity by race. Um, and so my team was one of the key, you know, connections with the researchers there and I got to work with them on that work. Um, Can you describe a little bit more about that study and what it found? Uh, sure. So, um, so Stan the, the researchers, the, the external researchers, essentially through this um, through this uh, partnership with the service, um, had access to administrative tax data um, and external to the service, they were um, estimating race uh, using this method that essentially uses um, a first name, last name, and zip code in order to estimate the basically the probability of someone's race. Um, so it's not even a direct match. It's not, you know, um, they did have a way to match to a sample of direct matches to kind of validate. But essentially that research showed that um, at least currently um, there is some disparity in the way in which um, the audit rate affects um, white taxpayers versus non-white taxpayers. Um, and so that kind of spurred a lot of uh, concern, of course. Um, IRS does not have access to race data, um, making that very clear. <laughs> um, but this was this kind of illuminated something that I think a lot of people had kind of considered or maybe thought about for a while that, you know, you can't know where your problems are without without really getting the good the, the the data that helps you understand your population, right? And so um, now we are exploring efforts to follow up on this um, and identify where the pain points are in the process um, that can alleviate and hopefully remediate this disparity found in specifically EITC audits. Um, so we're 
we're approaching that right now. I get to work on that follow-up project also. Um, and so that's an, an incredible opportunity that, again, I think the background of my work with poverty solutions of understanding one of the key things is just being able to look at a problem from a variety of different ways, right? And trying to understand the full picture of why might we be seeing this in the kind of outcomes? How can we take a step back and look at the processes and everything leading up to that? And I, I think it's it's worth reflecting on the fact that uh, I imagine it it wasn't a and you feel free not to comment on this, but I'll I'll throw out some musings. It wasn't a wonderful day for the IRS when this research came out, and which which found that people of color are more likely to be audited than uh, white Americans, and uh, but was only made possible by the partnership with the IRS, and so this um, sort of. Uh, from an institutional perspective, we want government partners that will release the data, are willing to acknowledge the problems and then look for concrete ways, as it sounds like you're doing, you call them pain point, I would sort of call them, yeah, the mechanisms, right? Of where, since since race isn't explicitly a part of the process, there have to be like triggers throughout uh, that are leading to this um, very racially unequal response. And so trying to figure out what those are and address them uh, is is the type of thing we want to see our public institutions do and be able to help them do. Michigan actually uh, was a leader because our incredible medical director at the start of COVID, Joni Caldoun, uh, very quickly started releasing um, uh, uh, COVID deaths and hospitalizations by race. And so we were able to see very quickly that there was this massive racial disparity that especially uh, black Michiganders were far more likely to be uh, killed by COVID or hospitalized by COVID. And, and the state uh, responded by putting together a task force uh, that put some evidence-based policies in place. And, and that uh, disparity was completely erased within just a few months after that, uh, which I, I think is a, a remarkable story. Uh, Pat, so um, maybe you can start by telling us what you were doing at Poverty Solutions and, uh, and maybe pick up a little bit of where Alyssa left off on home repair and, and some of the things that uh, we've been a part of as someone who knows sort of the broad landscape of the work we've been involved in. Yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, Pat Cooney. Um, I joined Poverty Solutions in 2018 as the uh, Assistant Director for Economic Mobility, which was a position we put in place to um, <clears throat> oversee the partnership with the city of Detroit. So we had a really close relationship with this, still have a really close relationship with the city of Detroit, um, where the goal was to bring research from U of M uh, to help inform the city's efforts to prevent and alleviate poverty, kind of broadly defined. So um, again, with the idea of starting with listening, my job was basically to go and sit at City Hall um, most days of the week and try to understand what government officials are working on. So how do they view poverty in the city? How do they view the obstacles facing the residents? Um, and then, of course, working with our staff and community groups to understand what are the priorities that um, that folks on the ground were, were sort of top of mind. Uh, and, uh, you know, so going off of home repair, this was, you know, this was this ended up being this huge body of work for us. Um, uh, and like Alyssa said, and like Luke mentioned, um, it basically, we didn't have to kind of go looking too hard for the problem once we started talking to people about it. Um, at almost every community meeting we went to, uh, there would be uh, two things that would pop up. Uh, uh, what is the biggest priority that's, you know, what, what, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in your life right now? Um, one was auto insurance, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a little bit. So auto insurance was uh, something we never thought we were going to work on, but it came up uh, frequently. And so we had, had no other choice. And then the second was home repair. So, you know, everyone was facing these home repair issues, old, really old housing stock in Detroit. Um, people who had owned their homes for years and years uh, were facing um, issues of, of disrepair. And I think what's really interesting about this was that it sort of reframed, I think, for us, a lot of the discussion around uh, affordable housing solutions. So I think no matter, you know, you look at general affordable housing solutions and there's, there's you know, a few different levers. There's building new housing that has affordable, you know, in sort of uh, d more developed areas with, that have affordable housing set asides or building housing with uh, low income housing tax credit dollars that are, you know, sort of set again, re rent regulated uh, affordable housing. Um, a lot of Detroiters, though, did not want those solutions necessarily. They wanted to stay in their own home. They just needed um, uh, help with 
um, with repairs, with health and safety repairs, and generally did not have the capital um, to take those on. And so this was actually, I think, something that, we, again, we worked at. We had um, uh, local foundations. Uh, we were able to structure a number of different programs that helped support the city's work in this area. We floated this to um, through Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib to the federal level as well, that this was actually, we saw a gap in um, in sort of President Biden's uh, the administration's affordable housing policies nationally was that this was some, something that not only is people in Detroit are struggling with, but this is happening in cities across the country. I think it's an overlooked area of the affordable housing kind of um, solutions that we could that we could be um, that we could be putting forth. And so the the ultimate outcome of this, though, of our kind of raising this, is that the city of Detroit now has a whole host of programs that are focused on home repair that are largely sort of um, informed by, by our work. We met with, when they got all this COVID money, we met with um, the, the folks who are implementing these, these programs. There's a program that's solely focused on roof repair in the city of Detroit. And they came to us and talked to us about it. They said, what, you know, we, we you know, know your work on home repair. What is the number one, you know, what is the number one repair that people are facing. And it's, you know, it's again, clear from the data from talking to folks, roofs were the number one thing. And so th these are sort of some of the ways in which um, our approach of sort of um, taking data in all its forms. So we work a lot with, you know, large data sets and with government data, uh, but also just talking to people, um, both people in the community and with government officials help to kind of narrow in on uh, where we should be kind of focusing our work. That's uh, the roof repair program is like a thirty million dollar program, yeah, right? And, and they keep adding to it. It's really successful. Or it's successful in the sense that there's a lot of people who need the help, yeah. and uh, the city is able to kind of um, to, to do that. Work. Do you have a sense of how many people have gone through it, or did you I don't. I don't. I don't know exactly, but um, but I know that I know it's and like right now. There's still a lot of COVID money, you know, of ARPA money, um, sort of left over, and you know, when that when that money uh, when they when they need sort of effective programs to devote funds to that one is a one that kind of keeps keeps coming up yeah we uh um had uh took a took a stand on american rescue plan dollars and in, in, in a number of ways uh i'm gonna note that uh, did a lot of work here in washington county uh pat was a part of uh op-ed in the new york times sort of building an op-ed in the new york times that are um, special advisor Robert Gordon uh, wrote about making sort of big like infrastructure investments, like critical investments that will persist over time with that. So home repairs, uh, roofing is a really good example of that, right? When you have a one-time pot of muddy, it's a chance to replace a lot of roofs, uh, which will last for 20 or 30 years. Lead abatement was an even bigger one. That was, we were big fans of that as a way to use that kind of money. So it's like using evidence and also think, trying to think strategically about what we can get the most out of, you know, what we have. Um, sending it back over to Josh. Uh, so uh, Alyssa mentioned sort of doing the cold calling of uh, uh, talking to uh, contractors. And I was wondering, uh, I remember actually when we started doing the auto insurance work, uh, you did a pretty important cold call to the zebra. So uh, I wonder if you could sort of tell a little bit about uh, the story of how we started working on auto insurance and what you did and um, and and maybe to the like what, what the data research product was that came out of it. Yeah. Um, so the auto insurance effort was was really miraculous when I look back on it. I mean, the amount of people involved, Pat was intimately involved with me working on that. The way that it started, of course, I think we've previewed here, which is we had at Poverty Solutions the opportunity to actually talk to folks and, and, and program staff about, like, what are your big issues? And so many people talk about economic mobility, getting people to work, making sure people have a good income. And in Detroit, if you ask people, like, what's a huge issue with you getting to work? It is the massive amount of money you have to spend on auto insurance in this state. And if you are a family making $40,000 a year, $30,000 a year, real average incomes in cities all across the state, that can feel impossible. And so, you know, riding dirty becomes the norm uh, because it's what you have to do to survive, which can also put you in a cycle. If you get caught, you then had to pay more fines, more fees when you already can't afford it in the first place. And so we heard all these stories, these really powerful, impactful stories. But when we looked for the data, it just wasn't there. Like there's not a lot of data on auto insurance rates that's at a particular level where you can understand like where are things the worst in Michigan? Like are rates the worst up north? Are they worse in the city? By how much? 
And so we got creative and uh, we knew that there Josh were all these- Josh got creative. <laughs> the Josh factor. Um, there's all these national companies. If you go online right now to shop for auto insurance, you can go to places that are like, we'll show you quotes from all state. We'll show you quotes from this. And what you do is you go in and you say, I'm a male, I'm 30 years old. I have this driving history. And they give you an estimate for a whole bunch of companies, right? How do they do that? And how, where do they get the data from? And so as I was just acting as an auto insurance shopper, I said, they have information that's not out there. They, and so we reached out to, their, uh, to the company, to the Zebra, talked to their data folks, and they had never really been approached. They, they had no process for doing this. Um, but they had a report on their website that they are really proud of because they themselves were doing some research from a private industry perspective, which I thought was really good, on affordability of auto insurance. Uh, it wasn't specific as much to our needs. And so we reached out. They gladly shared the data because they knew Poverty Solutions' reputation. They knew University of Michigan's reputation. Uh, and with that data, we were able to sort of estimate what the rates would be at every zip code in this state. So I'm in 48224. I know my, the average auto insurance rate uh, pretty intimately. At the time, it was around $4,000 a year. Um, I don't have $4,000 a year to spend on auto insurance, right? Like that's anybody saying that. It, it becomes crazy. Uh, we were able to marry then that data with those rates to what we knew about those communities. So are rates higher in low-income communities? Yes. Are rates higher in predominantly African-American communities? Yes. Are rates lower in more wealthier suburbs? Yes. We didn't have definitive answers to those questions. And the data allowed us to, I think, put in perspective for policymakers the long-term trend that was developing into a crisis. And so we were lucky that so much of the debate about auto insurance was really hot at the time. Folks were really frustrated at the system. And in many of the reports you see between Republicans and Democrats talking to each other about auto insurance, they're citing this study. So it was really gratifying to work with places like the Mackinac Policy Center, a much more conservative right-wing center, and then places like uh, the Center for American Progress, a more left center, both of them saying the same thing, which is what we were noticing, which is what people told us. And so what we're able to do is use data to elevate the truth in the stories that we were told. And it really resonated with people. Shortly thereafter, you know, the Poverty Solutions was testifying in Congress on auto insurance. Josh was testifying before Congress. So tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit about testifying before Congress. Too. What, what was that like? You'd never done it? and uh... No, it is, it's a bit of a scary phenomenon. If you ever get asked by Congress to testify, even if you're not... Uh, somebody with a famous last political name. It's a little terrifying. You wait in a hallway in a, and then you go into a back room and there's barely any water or snacks. The snacks here are much better. And then you're lined up and you're grilled by people with very esteemed titles. And so there was a lot of skepticism on policymakers' parts because we don't think of auto insurance as a national issue. So from the congressional perspective, it was like, okay, this is fine for Michigan, but why are you here? And I think what we were able to show kind of in that testimony was this is a trend that's happening. And it's a trend that can happen in any state that makes the kind of policy decisions that Michigan has made. And so if Michigan needed to be a canary in the coal mine, so be it. Because we were saying, you know, people, all these initiatives that either presidents or congress, congresspersons or senators have, you can't get people to work if they hit a barrier as soon as they leave their house, you know, and trying to get to the car. Um, so from that experience, I think it, it elevated the issue even more. Um, it was really gratifying, I think, for all of us who had worked on this to see like when Whitmer had made some changes citing our studies and in the fixes that need to be done now, still citing our work and the work that Pat had been able to continue on, okay, you know, it's not just, policy is not a one-shot solution. It is a consistent dedication to looking at the evidence and being willing to admit where things are going wrong and then push forward on them. And I think universities can help people get out of the funk of feeling like they have to play a side and instead just deal with the problem uh, as it is and not, you know, the performance that I think a lot of institutions have to put on. Yeah, so uh, a follow-up study, but Pat, were you the author on that? Uh, and Amanda, of course, was there anybody else on that? Or Maybe. Just a minute. Okay, great, great team. Um, found uh, sort of rates after the 2019 reform, rates go down by about $1,000 a year in the city of Detroit. So there's still way too high, but you know, a thousand dollars is a, is not an insignificant amount of money. Um, but also found that this sort of correlation between the percent black in a, in a zip code and, um, and the auto insurance rate is the single best predictor. And so, uh, 
you know, some progress through reform and then more work to be done. So it sort of follows the cycle of like starting with listening, trying to use evidence to find a set of solutions, uh, be a part of implementing those solutions, but then continue to evaluate because uh, we rarely get it totally right the first time. So Alyssa, would the contractors talk to you? Like, what did you, how did you get them to even talk to you? And what did you do with the information? A great question. They did, they did talk to me, actually. I was kind of surprised each and every time they let me have 30 minutes of their time. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Why do you think that was? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't know. I, um, I think when I made it clear that my efforts were for research purposes, first and foremost, um, and I, you know, just kind of, I think navigating those conversations were, was really about having a conversation. It wasn't about like, you know, anything too formal necessarily having my questions all written up, but really trying to engage with them more as just another human being who I'm like, yeah, I acknowledge you probably encounter a lot of barriers as well as a contractor. You know, I want to hear about that. And people are, I mean, oftentimes happy to kind of talk about themselves and their problems they're facing. And so I was just there to collect that really. Yeah, little known fact, <laughs> yeah. people generally like to talk about themselves. <laughs> if you treat them with respect, people mm -hmm. like to talk about themselves. Right, exactly. And so just acknowledging, you know, you've been in this business for a long time. Can you tell me about that? And I think a lot of them just hadn't really been asked before about this. So I think for them, it was kind of an interesting um, way to share because I think on as much as uh, citizens needed assistance with affordable home repair, I think contractors wanted the experience to be better as well. So when I said, you know, this is an effort to, you know, understand the landscape of, of the challenges for home repair in the city of Detroit, they were, I think, understanding of that approach. And what were some of the insights? I know this is going a little back in time for you, but like what uh, were some of the things they said? Where were they getting caught up in the system? Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting, actually. I mean, I think two of the biggest themes that I remember, um, I mean, one, which I think a lot of people were pretty familiar with is just a lot of contractors experienced a fair amount of theft at their um, work sites. And so it was extra people stealing their stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which, um, you know, I've gone through a full house, uh, you know, bought a house from a land bank, gutted the house with my partner and, and, you know, they had it, it your, your house gets broken into and things get stolen. If you leave things in there, it, it, it does happen on a fairly regular basis, but for contractors, that's like a huge part of their business, right? So they just had to take so much more effort to get their things in and out. And it just requires more time and setup and then repurchasing the items. Um, so that was a big one. Another one that I was, I mean, was kind of really interesting was the amount of time it took them to get permits. Um, they would have to send one of their workers down to, you know, BC, the building and safety division and pay for parking all day, pay for them to just sit around and wait for their permits all day. And like, that was a cost as well. And so they would add that in. Um, and the third thing that I remember being pretty significant was um, labor. Just, um, I think, small independent contractors, um, they would, with a lot of the development that was happening in the city during this time frame that I was looking at, which was like 2017, 18, there was a lot of new big buildings being built. Um, so, you know, multi-family housing, um, just different office buildings, that sort of thing. And so a lot of the skilled labor was going to those bigger projects. They were union jobs. Um, so they were paying, you know, they were able to just kind of have that security of a union job, the laborers were. So I think smaller contractors were having trouble um, finding good workers and keeping good workers around. Um, so those were probably the three biggest things that I, I found it fascinating and gave me a bigger and better perspective of just like how the economic landscape operates in Detroit in this kind of space. Yeah, I think it could have been easy to go into those conversations and assume uh, that, uh, you know, when you see this premium and people not getting served, that the, that the contractors were the villains. And uh, not to say that there isn't, there's villains among every group. And, and uh, but in, in this case, uh, I think by starting by asking questions and doing so respectfully, it sort of elucidated some of the but both some policy levers, right? If if the city could get permits done faster, it would alleviate some of this pressure. And uh, some of the reasons for a premium that if 
if if I either have to cart my stuff back every single night or I need to replace it all the time, it is going to cost me more to do this building. And then as a policy response, we can think about what we want to do with that. But it's a deeper and richer understanding of what's going on. Yeah, I think I think it gave a much fuller perspective on it. And and I think some of the issues, you know, of course, with um, theft and security, I think that's like a more deeply seated issue that I think was just, you know, is to a certain extent just a reality. But the other issues that I think were were pressing on on labor and on permits, um, you know, those are things that I think you can actually really make good progress on. Of course, there's many layers to a challenge like this, sort of going out with uh, who has access to get the credentialing and able to be able to do the repairs in the first place. And I think a long history of, of structural racism related to like where you had to go, you know, what you had to do to get those credentials. So, uh, you know, we're trying to look at every single level of the challenge to produce solutions that'll work better for, for people. And I do think, I will say, I do think these days the the city of Detroit has implemented a lot more efforts Quite toward workforce development and labor and skilled trades, which is like really exciting to see. Um, so I've seen, you know, more news in that space. And from that research, I've just been really encouraged that that is, you know, progress being made on that front. So we uh, yeah. <laughs> have been delighted to be a big part of right. uh, many of those uh, efforts. Uh, so um Pat, uh, you uh, worked uh, with me and, and Sam Jabayad and some others on some work around like the impacts of the COVID safety net and what we saw. So I think this was the first time you were uh, cited in the, on the front page of the New York Times uh, 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 issue. And, and then also we're a big part of efforts to make sure that uh, folks in Michigan and in, in Detroit knew about the child tax credit. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your work there and also like some of the things we learned in terms of how you reach out to people to let them know when things really are available. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the time Luke was referencing when we got uh, our research cited on the front page of the New York Times, my, uh, my mother-in-law was not impressed though because she said she thought there was going to be a picture of me in the New York Times. <laughs> and and uh, so it wasn't enough. Um, but, um, yeah, no, the, uh, you know, the, this I think goes back to a little bit of the poverty solutions, uh, again, kind of general, um, kind of core, uh, motivator that drives our work is looking for kind of data wherever you can, can find it. Um, you know, we were basically when the COVID relief, uh, efforts were happening, um, in the early stages, um, we went out to find data to try and figure out how um, how folks were were doing, um, uh, and our instinct was that um, that folks were going to be kind of not doing you know very well at all. We thought that there, there was some early reports that were coming out that were saying you know sort of poverty is sort of moderating; it's not as bad as people think. And we were saying, "What are you talking about?" There's there's lines you know um, at at food pantries, and and there's um, there's all there's hardship everywhere. And so we went and dug up this, um, the U.S. Census Bureau was doing this household poll survey, which was um, re releasing at the time, I think it was monthly, and they started doing it biweekly. And, um, but they were asking um, households about their material hardship. So are you, you know, able to um, sort of pay for your, you know, pay your, uh, your bills, are you able to afford enough food, things like that. And so we started tracking that data over time. And what we found was that, um, to our, kind of to our surprise, was that when there was robust, um, or pleasantly surprised, when there was robust government assistance, we saw uh, material hardship declining and declining pretty substantially. Um, and, uh, and then during the periods when the, the assistance lagged, um, you see hardship kind of rise in this data. And so this was like, we're getting kind of real time data on how folks were doing and their ability to afford um, basic expenses. And what was interesting for us, we a, a very kind of um, uh, s relatively simple story began to emerge. Um, this was a time when the U.S. sort of completely flipped its traditional safety net on its head. So the traditional safety net, of course, is sort of means tested. So you get resources when you are sort of lower income uh, and is largely in kind. So they offer instead of offering just cash, they'll offer, you know, SNAP benefits for food or housing vouchers for housing. And, and so it's kind of 
sometimes it'll be harder to get. You have to apply for these things, all, all these different things. And what we saw during the pandemic was that the um, safety net was lo- almost universal. Some, you know, vast majority of folks were getting stimulus checks. Uh, unemployment insurance was much more generous. Um, and it was, it was largely cash based. So people were just getting checks sent to their home. Um, uh, and then again, the other leg of this, of course, was the expanded child tax credit that happened. Um, uh, and that was again, largely a, um, uh, um, you know, as universal as, 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 as you can get for, um, for households with children, um, sending checks out, um, every month for a period of six months. Um, and so we, we see this, we, what we've seen in the data was that this money when we got sent out would have essentially like immediate, immediate impact, um, and, and help to alleviate hardship kind of quite, quite quickly. Um, Luke and I were talking before this about what we've seen sort of since the end of some of the COVID measures. Um, so in, you know, 2021, you saw, um, uh, sort of poverty fall to record lows, child poverty fall to record lows in 2022 after assistance was withdrawn. You saw um, poverty, income poverty um, shoot up. And in addition, we were talking about sort of the um, food insecurity measure is also sort of rising and other kind of hardship measures that we try and balance the poverty measure with are also rising. So, um, so yeah, no, it was a, it was a um, sort of very interesting time to be evaluating the U.S. safety net and having kind of real-time data to understand what the impact is on households. The last thing I'll say, Luke is referencing our efforts toward around making sure that folks knew about the uh, expanded child tax credit um, and were able to access their, or, or we did it with the stimulus checks as well. This was another big thing, I think, of, of our work with Poverty Solutions was that sort of a policy passed is not, you know, there's a lot, there's many more steps that happen after that. And those sometimes those are the, those are the hardest steps. Um, so some of the things that we ran into with households getting their stimulus checks with their expanded child tax credits was, again, this was as nearly universal and that meant it included families that had no uh, sort of earnings. Um, and uh, they were sending this out largely through, um, through the tax code. And for folks that didn't have earnings and hadn't filed before, this presented a kind of a unique policy problem uh, that they, the IRS may not have had any information on these households. How do we get them to, um, to get this, this funding? So we set up a website with kind of really plain language to try and get folks um, uh, to understand what the steps they had to take on through the IRS to make sure that they knew that they could, they were eligible for this, this funding. Um, we tried to get this sort of spread far and wide through community partners. We worked with the state, we worked with the state of Michigan, um, to send out a text message to all SNAP recipients. Um, this was actually, an, this was this intervention that we, we did where we were getting really low take up on, on, on people sort of, um, uh, signing on to this IRS portal to get to get signed up um, for the child tax credit, um, and we um, went through. We when you sent this this um, text message this, through the state of Michigan, we saw traffic to our site that we had set up just skyrocket. It went kind of through the roof. I think it was a fourteen hundred percent increase. Yes, yeah, so it was. It was. It was. It was uh, by by um, by sort of any um, uh, sort of evaluative measure it was it was um, pretty amazing, and we were uh, we were working with. At the time, we were working with Gene Sperling, who's one of President Biden's top advisors, who was in charge of making sure that these policies actually reached people. And so we have this slide that we uh, of you know showing sort of steady traffic to our website, then it shoots up by fourteen hundred percent, and then it goes down again, and then we send this text message out again, it shoots up by fourteen hundred percent. So we have this slide, and Gene Sperling has since used it in like all of his presentations about you know how do you get make sure people know about these things. Um, and so, yeah, no, it was, um, it was, a, it was definitely a lesson in, I think when I went into this work, uh, I assumed it was all sort of about the policymaking process. This was definitely a lesson in that is just the, the earliest stage. And, um, and again, not necessarily even the easiest stage in making sure people actually receive their benefits. So I'm going to uh, spend a second to uh, scan the audience, see if anybody uh, themselves have questions, and I will continue to pepper these folks with questions for the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but put your hand up if uh, you want to follow up on any of these or ask about something else. Thanks. Introduce yourself, too. Hi, I'm Sadie. I'm um, an MSW student here at Michigan, obviously. And um, thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your experience. It's been really beneficial. Um, I know that maybe you don't know, but some of us are in a class here. So a lot of us are students and then some people just from the community. Um, But this is more from a student perspective, a question for all of you. 
Um, what was your experience like at Michigan and what experiences did you take advantage of to kind of prepare you for a career in policy and a career in this work after you graduated? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, whew, I feel like I did. So for me, um, becoming a research assistant with Poverty Solutions was a key experience that I think was really beneficial and really helped prepare me for future work. Um, getting to do the in-depth uh, research that I was able to do, especially from a data-driven perspective, um, that is like, it, it prepared me entirely for the work I do today. Um, so, you know, in the research division that I'm in right now, we get to work with data and, and, and produce this research that can then help inform, you know, other people's decision making. That's again, very directly related to what we do here. Um, I think the other things uh, for me, it was, I wanted to gain a lot more technical skills while I was at University of Michigan, because I think in my first year in the public policy program, that was a big kind of gap that I identified in talking with people who are working in the public sector. I knew I wanted to go into the public sector after graduating. Um, and so the following two years, one, I added the dual degree with School of Information in order to really like strengthen the technical skills that I have. Some people are able to self-teach themselves. I was not. Um, <laughs> but um, so anyway, I, I spent then the next two years trying to keep connected to the intersection of data and policy. Um, so whether it was work with Poverty Solutions, I did, you know, internships that were very related to um, basically diving into huge data sets and trying to identify um, how policy could uh, be, make some pretty important changes based on those findings. Um, yeah, I think just any type of research, I did like two or three different types of research assistantships and just getting hands on data and projects were, was critical. Um, Josh, I, don't know. Uh, I got my MPP at the University of Michigan, the public policy degree. Uh, absolutely loved it. I had a really unique journey that m might resonate for some folks. So I came to my grad school program right out of undergrad. Uh, and for a master's of public policy degree, it t tends to be folks will go out and work for a couple years and then get their master's. I was head <laughs> headstrong and like, I want to do this. Um, and so for me, some of those pivotal lessons was how can I catch up to the level of knowledge my peers have? How can I catch up to the level of leadership? And how can I really use this moment to learn? I think for any student, the first thing is like recognize that you you should be in any space that you want to be as long as you're respectful. There's no place that you shouldn't be. So check out those groups. Talk to that professor who looks really famous and is always busy. Like, you know, you would you would think looking at Luke's calendar, he wouldn't have time. Became one of my best friends, you know. Uh, and that, and I just started as an MPP student. Um, the second thing is take that opportunity at a university to like learn leadership lessons from other people. Because one of the big things that you're going to take away after you leave school is like, how do I navigate the workplace? How do I navigate challenges? And the skill sets that you use, I think, help you make the case um, more effectively. And so I, I really echo Alyssa's point. But there's also like, how do, how do I leverage who I am? Who is that? And how is this person going to work through any particular issue, particularly with a lot of these problems that folks in public policy might encounter, deeply emotional, deeply contentious, kind of hard to think about for a long time. So finding that time to figure out who you are and what you want. At a university, you really don't have any other experience in your life other than being in school to do that as effectively as you can here. And so leveraging all those unique opportunities, try something you don't think you'd be good at. You know, I would say if you, in high school, I had failed a math class. I remember this. I took summer school math. And then I'm at the University of Michigan taking econometrics and taking big data analytics at the Ross School, right? Like challenge your notion of who you are. This is one of the best times to do it. And use that in service of what you believe in and, and your values. Um, and look at all the departments. You know, I was really lucky to have a set of professors who were interdisciplinary in their work, right? Luke works with public health, works with policy, works with business. He'll work with anybody at the University of Michigan. And I really learned from that, from folks like him, from folks like Betsy Stevenson, um, that if you want to get the real work done, it takes a lot of people and it takes you kind of challenging. So I took classes that, honestly, I would have said a year before I took them. No way. I'm not ready. I'm going to fail that class. I'm going to be so embarrassed. Uh, and then I did it and I was like, 
ah, this is what's cool about it. Um, and so that let me do really cool things that were really impactful later. One of them, I'll give a really specific example, is like geospatial analysis, a fancy word for using maps and data to understand trends. Um, I took this on as just a challenge activity in school. I was like, I know nothing about geography. I know nothing about geospatial analytics or any of these fancy words. Years later, I'm here at MDHHS trying to figure out what is the distance between our welfare offices and a COVID testing site or a place to get the vaccine. And we didn't have anybody paid fancy on staff who could do that an analysis, but I was able to do it and put up a map for the first time that was interactive that said, here's where our offices are and here's how far away they're from the clinic. Why can't we use this community center that's halfway between them and there to instead provide our services? And so those skill sets, they will come up a little bit later. And so keep all of your work stuff or your school stuff too. Like have a OneDrive that can never be deleted. Keep all your course material. Keep every assignment you've ever did. I'll tell you, I go back and reference slides from old lectures all the time. Uh, Mostly mine. Mo mo <laughs> the impeccable slides of Luke Schaefer. <laughs> I would add, if you have a passion, if you have a very specific interest, um, just at, like keep asking for ways in which you can follow that up. So for me, it was housing in Detroit and specifically working with data. And I was really interested as well in like economic development. The Strategic Neighborhood Fund was really like kicking off during the time I was in school. And I was like, I just want to like focus on this. So I had the opportunity to do a thesis with School of Information, but like I kind of also had to push my way in there and ended up with like, a, an advisor in policy and in school of information and just like all the different things that I did were all like I knew I had this passion and core goal and just like worked around or worked through some different barriers in the different institutions here to uh, pursue that and I think yeah just to Josh's point of like figuring out what it is that you want and then just like you can do it you might have to jump through some barriers but like you can do it. I'm going to make one point while we uh, we look for other raised hands. Um, I, I think one really interesting thing about the current moment in time is how much data is available from different sources. So I think you heard about different kinds of data from each one of um, our speakers today. And uh, it's just uh, lots of different institutions are thinking about how to make their data more accessible, just like the IRS, uh, the Zebra. Uh, we were able in the, with the child tax credit stuff to um, use macro level data from JP Morgan Chase that's released information on uh, tens of millions of bank accounts. And you could see sort of more buffer in people's checkings accounts uh, while the child tax credit was in place. Um, so getting those those tangible skills, everybody loves a map. That's one thing I've learned at Poverty Solutions. Like people go crazy for interactive maps. So uh, that GIS uh, work, um, you know, those technical skills uh, combined with the leadership skills, but uh, the technical skills are things you can't pick up other places. And if you're not going to force yourself to do it now, you're probably not going to force yourself to do it later. So uh, I think really great advice. And I'm not going to let Pat answer this question unless... <laughs> Pat has no technicals. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is it really the case you failed a math class, Josh? <laughs> I don't actually, because my kind of dominant picture of Josh which I got to see again just before this lecture, is Josh seated on a chair with his laptop on his knee. And often he would do this inside a meeting and we would have the answer to our question at the end of his time on the on the And knee. a really beautiful slide deck. And yeah. a really beautiful slide deck that would come out of nowhere. Um, and, and so I think that it is, like one of the things, and this connects to Adam Seltzer's lecture um, from Sevilla about them taking six months to kind of understand the policy framework. There's a part of this that is just incredibly hard work to get yourself from the place of not knowing to the place where you do know. Um, but you can fail, you can be the person who failed a math class in high school and then become like one of the, the data leads in the state. Um, you can do that. Alyssa corrected a bunch of our kind of assumptions on the opportunity index in Washington County. So students can figure out problems that we as staff are not seeing. So um, I think that this, this is a, there's a beautiful lesson here that I want to just pause on. But I also want other questions. And Sevi has a question, so. Hello there. Uh, my name is Sevi 
Fula, and I am a MSW student here, at the School of Social Work. Uh, it's interesting because in our classes, we're learning a lot about things such as racial capitalism. And it's interesting because even in some of the things that you're doing, like you're talking about like auditing and how it affects, you know, the people of color or even auto insurance and how as well, like it, it's affecting, you know, uh, people of color, black Americans, things of that nature. It's interesting how we see the same, like, I don't know if it's a trend in data, but we see the same groups are disproportionately affected. And I, I'm kind of curious, like, what are your thoughts on, is it the system? Is it, cause you would think that we're all, you know, we're all the same, you know, like under the law, we're, we're all created equally or treated equally, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. If you look at the data, I'm just, yeah, curious, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention a chapter of my new book called The Invisible Hand. I and mean, really the title and the idea is like, uh, you know, we've heard about like the invisible hand of capitalism to make sure there's enough fish and enough fires. And I really think of like structural racism as being an invisible hand that just pushes in so many different direction. So um, auto insurance is an example where, where there are algorithms that mean that black Americans pay way more in auto insurance than, uh, than white Americans. And uh, that's left to the companies. And I don't think they have race in their algorithms, but somehow that's the way it works out. And you see the same thing with homeowners insurance, uh, you know, where you're overcharged for homeowners insurance. But uh, homes of black Americans are underappraised uh, in, partic in particular. So sort of more of the costs and less of the benefits of home ownership. So I, I think that's part of where the field and where like now that we have this huge increase in our data infrastructure, we need to go to. And the key, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is that there's not one thing we can do to fix all of the problems. I think we need to understand that like we are talking about compounded uh, inequality, right, uh, across so many different dimensions. I would actually try to, you know, we can all try to think of a system that there's not a, a major racial disparity in that's meaningful to, you know, we, we're supporting some incredible work here on campus around pediatric health care um, that is, is really focused on in, in finding racial disparities in a lot of how people are treated, even when they they get into the doctor's office. Um, so uh, the key, I think, is then like the work that Alyssa's doing at the IRS is like try to figure out how is it that the system always seems to end up to, to work that way and how do we change the mechanism? So in my chapter, it's around disaster relief. Uh, so it turns out if uh, communities get hit by a flood or a hurricane or a tornado, it turns out predominantly higher income and predominantly white communities um, end up actually uh, wealthier as a result. So it's it's horrible to get hit by a flood no matter what. But in higher income communities, uh, they get assistance, which means actually their homes end up better valued than they were before. In, in uh, very low income communities and uh, especially communities of color, especially black communities, uh, that get hit by a natural disaster end up poorer, less wealthy. So a policy that should at least have no effect on inequality actually exacerbates inequality. And um, there are a number of mechanisms by which that happens. One is around property ownership. And uh, what does it, we think of like, I own a home, I don't as being a binary type thing, but really, uh, you know, there's, uh, in Detroit, uh, but especially in the South, just huge numbers of people have had their homes passed down from generation to generation without any formal inheritance. And so until just the last couple of years, uh, in part because of, of uh, many, many, including us, raising the issue, uh, if you didn't have clear title to your home, you couldn't get any help at all. So um, uh, especially the large proportion of Black Americans in the South who had had their property just passed down from generation to generation, they were just excluded from help pretty much altogether. And that's just one of the levers. So it really means like, we want to talk about this stuff at the high level, but it, it also means like we have to get into the weeds, like the nuts and bolts of structural racism in order to get different results and, and sort of understand that it's not, there's not one system. It's, it's across, 
so many different facets of life. I mean, the other thing I'll, I'll add up to that is that we, you know, we started to get, um, I think, far more intentional in our public writing about current policies and potential policy, policy solutions of sort of digging into the racially discriminatory history of a lot of the sort of foundations of our current policy. So, you know, we talked a lot about um, home repair and auto insurance and different insurance markets. And a lot of those are, you know, right, you can make this case, right, that they are, it's, it may be discriminatory, but based on geography. But of course, you know, the geography um, uh, in our metropolitan areas is um, sort of racially defined based on historical housing policies. Um, um, and, uh, you know, sort of outright racial discrimination in federal policies on um, whether they would insure the mortgages of black home buyers or whether, um, you know, certain parts of the city were deemed sort of, you know, unlendable. Um, sort of those outright racially discriminatory policies, um, you know, you can make, in, it's like sort of in today's world, you can make, you can sort of, people can make a, uh, a case that, oh, you know, there's, there's not a sort of racial element to this policy, but it's based on decades of when it was kind of outright, outright um, racially discriminatory. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, being uh, far more intentional about the history of those things. And like Luke said, to then fix those things, it's getting um, really deeply into the, the nuts and bolts of how these policies work and trying to um, trying to dismantle them. I mean, the, la the last thing I'll say on this is just that you know, we did a ton of work when we were, in, we're working um, with the city on property taxes. Property taxes in Detroit are a complete mess. Um, they have one of the highest property tax rates in the, in the country. And that led to, um, in the wake of the Great Recession, it led to so many property tax foreclosures because of um, obviously the recession, people having less income, but also the city's sort of processes were in place to adjust property taxes um, um, when pre people's property values fell tremendously. Uh, and so there were pe pay people paying artificially high property taxes for years. Um, and so this is one of these things that, you know, it's funny after, you know, a, you know, more than a decade later, and after all our work on it, there's more and more, you know, there's, there's sort of, we keep chipping away at this policy and the cities now, if folks are following it, are they're in this effort to move towards this land value tax. It'd be one of the first cities in the country to go move as aggressively as they have towards a land value tax, which is basically it would be, it's a tax on the land rather than a tax on the prop on the property that you build on the land. And um, it's really interesting because it seeks to solve a lot of the problems that Detroit is facing in terms of speculative property ownership and um, longtime homeowners getting facing too high property taxes to try. It's an effort to try and kind of solve multiple problems at once. And it's, it's I think it's a really promising solution. And um, but all I have to say, you've got to get into the deep nuts and bolts to kind of remedy, I think, these you know decades of um, of, of uh, discriminatory policies. Oh, that's um, well, one good question. Clearly, you're taking notes in class. <laughs> you had the whole the words and everything. Um, it's a question that I grapple with probably every day. You know, why uh, why does a country not do what it says it does? And then I remember I say I'm going to go to the gym, and I don't. There's so many instances where um, within policy, I think there is a tendency to, and one thing that this center does really well is like, don't make it too abstract. Make it local make it personal, make it real. Because all these issues are done by real people with real names, with real lives. And so one of the things you can do at an institution like Michigan is you have the time to really understand your history. Learn the history of the block that you're on. Who, who is the one who put up those homes on the corner that look nicer than the other ones? What did they do for work? How did they get here? How did their family get here? In their stories, you were going to see the tragic decisions that were made that at the time seemed right, but if we now know are wrong, and in, and in hindsight, it is, I think, then the responsibility of anyone in, in the public to think, how can I think as I'm writing my own history that I won't have students 20, 30 years looking back and saying, why did they do that? I think being willing to look at data in ways that challenge your conceptions is super helpful. And one of the things that I think all these projects at Poverty Solutions do because the issue is systemic, which all that means, that big word means is that you find it in almost every arena, right? You go to a hospital, 
you might get treated differently because of who you are. You interact with a police officer, you might get treated differently. You go to get groceries, you might pay different prices. In all of that, there are people. And so the question of why is deeply embedded in the humanity of who you're around. And try to figure that out. I'm still in the midst of doing it. I think as a country, we're in the midst of doing it. But don't let that dishearten you because in learning those stories, you can then say, if this decision was different, that's a different world. And that's powerful. And I think the only thing I'd like to add, I think that is like absolutely key. And to your point of how local and personal it all is, I want to also... I think that's something that I thought that I was going to, after graduating, continue into much more local efforts. I thought, you know, this is where kind of my my understanding is grounded. I think there's like so much more movement and, and impact to be had here. Um, and it was something that was really interesting to me joining the federal government that there are opportunities to really make a difference, I think, um, if you seek them out and really make a push to know that's your North Star of I want to address this in my work. Um, there are really, really incredible opportunities at higher levels as well. And having been having the grounding of a poverty solutions experience, like working in research or education, whatever it is, you then take that experience to that level and you take that understanding. And I think that is incredibly powerful as well to really connect it at an even, to, to connect your understanding of local to the bigger levels as well. I think I, I want to just mention too that um, the answer that we just had to that question, at least from Poverty Solutions, I think uh, we've come a long way on this. So I think when we started as initiative, sort of coming out of poverty research, it was it was not the norm. I think people acknowledge differences, but um, by race, but to really understand how much is driven, how much is systemic in in the many different ways. Um, is I think it's a, a place that we've grown and continue to grow. It's not a, it, you know, uh, it's not a binary state either. And um, I, I, you know, one of my worries about a panel like this is it feels like a victory lap for poverty solutions. And I guess one of the ways I like to guard against that is I think in every one of these stories, there's sort of some element of us having been wrong that started the journey, right? So Pat and I started this whole line of work on, hardship during the pandemic because I was certain everybody was like in horrible condition. And then when we looked at the day, we found out actually what we were doing was working like pretty well, like better than anything we've ever done. And the auto insurance um, question is one that we never would have come up. You know, it wouldn't have been on my top hundred things and uh, in home repair, honestly, too. And so I think uh, we'll try to ground the victory lap of today and also a sense that like we all need to do this work with incredible humility uh, to assume that we we don't know all the right answer, you know, issues to to focus on. We don't know exactly how to take them. And so, you know, that is also I think social work, you're here in a social work building of like reflective practice is is something that's really critical to doing this work well. So thanks everyone for coming. Make sure don't send any more cookies back. Take all the cookies because I've been eating too many cookies. Uh, and thanks to our incredible panel and come up and say hello to them. <laughs>